special. Now, the first part of that presentation um, uh, will cater to the general audience. The programmable pervasive space and programming models may not do the same, may be more specific to some of you. So um, I'll try to balance things a little bit. We all have seen these charts many places, aging and disabilities, uh, aging with disabilities, aging into disabilities, disability itself of the normal disability population, war is bringing in more disabilities. We have a lot of issues and a lot of responsibilities. We have to respond uh, to all this. But the, the problem is that population is increasing in both aging and disability. And everybody has seen that chart many times. I'm sure all of you have seen. But uh, basically, this is the population in uh, 1990, how so many people over the age of um, uh, 85. And that's double this year. So in just 10 years, we have a double. So there's an exponential effect. Before we know it, we have no uh, system that can actually sustain that large number of elder people. And uh, elder people are living longer, not just in the United States, but around the world. It's just a byproduct of something, of uh, uh, good food or <laughs> good time. I don't know exactly, but uh, people are living longer, which is good so long as people live uh, independently and live happily. So the well-being of the well-being of the people is important. The well-being of the uh, of the bank, of the government money, is important. So we have to figure out uh, uh, ways to uh, keep up with that trend. People don't just grow older. People grow with disabilities or with severe disabilities, or they actually may need even constant assistance, like uh, people who come go and visit the home or the space where the elder people live and provide assistance in way of activities, normal activities of daily living, bathing, feeding, and all that. So uh, these are population data that show you that the numbers are staggering and increasing. Some of these problems are very costly. You can actually attach a uh, dollar amount to them. Chronic diseases, uh, diabetes, for example. Okay, so uh, half of the diabetes population in the United States are actually an elder population, 50%, staggering. Dementia is increasing uh, worldwide. Uh, neuromotor medicine compliance is another. Pretty much older, even uh, people my age, even younger, have problem actually remembering to take their medications. So uh, uh, amazingly, I remember to take my medication this morning. <laughs> but that's not what happens every day. Depression, social health is not there. And then home safety, uh, a lot of uh, Accidents happen at home, falls one of them, and then home care delivery, which is very challenging. We can instrument everything we can, do our best, but how can you deliver real physical assistance at home? That becomes still a challenge. Somebody needs help dressing, so our smart home uh, will not will be able to actually help a person dress up. So when it comes to home care delivery, that becomes again the ultimate challenge. But it's too difficult of a problem, so we push it down in the stack here. As I said, you can attach dollar amount, $61 uh, million dollar per year, uh, can go to dementia and cognitive impairment. An Alzheimer patient costs 85 hours of home care per week per person. You have to find a workforce. You have to look at the nursing school and other, um, uh, uh, and other institutions to see if we're actually producing that workforce, and we are not. There's a problem. So that's more of a reason why we need to instrument and come up with ideas to, to compensate. 60% of all Floridians are obese or overweight. This is one stage where you, know, you can go out almost all year round. 60%. And you all know what obesity does to the rest of uh, the health pro uh, profile of a person, the way of uh, heart diseases and, and others. Uh, diabetes. Diabetes is a big problem, as I mentioned, 132 billion per year heart failure, and you can keep going on and on. And at the end, you see where the money goes, uh, the responsibilities that the governments have to uh, provide to the people, and where it's going to saturate and stop in bad economies. So we have way more responsibilities than you can ever imagine. OK, so I do research that is interdisciplinary in assistive environments, try to create instruments and create assistive environments for elder people. And as far as uh, e-health or personal health, I focus primarily on obesity and diabetes, 
and that is actually joint research with uh, Dr. Cook. The kind of research I do, uh, or my team uh, uh, does is where we combine pervasive computing with some domain specific research. Uh, so we have a population, we have a particular goal, set of concern, and then we create prototype quickly and try to understand from this prototype what is fundamental, and then um, try to do end user validation, and then we disseminate the research, and sometimes we do some commercialization. That looks like very nice, but uh, non-trivial cases, we have crossed the red line. We just jump from pervasive computing to dissemination drive papers also. <coughs> we did not do the end user validation all the time, which is not perfect, but we do it for different uh, pressure. One of them is excitement. We want to get an idea out very quickly. Uh, Sometimes we'll also wait to be prototype, which is a little bit better situation and disseminate. So it's not that we don't cross the red line. Now let's go to the smart house. It's a normal 2,500 square feet uh, single family home in uh, uh, Gainesville. Uh, it looks like a normal house. This is the living area. It's supposed to be a dining area, but it's actually a meeting room. This is where the activity is kitchen, uh, breakfast nook. There's a living room. Um, this is the bedroom suite, walk-in closet, bathroom. And that side of the house is more like a, the laboratory for my students and I. This is where we actually uh, do things. And this room on the top here is where the students sleep on punk beds uh, in case we need to do an RA, a resident assistant. So we lock that side and we are doing uh, some kind of an uh, agreed upon uh, monitoring, which is part of the IRB. It's like this is how we're going to monitor and intervene if we need to. So it actually gives more safety net to the subjects who are helping us. Over here, something called a driving simulator, which is not exactly a smart home concept, but it's located uh, in the garage because just it fits the car. So here is where we focus also on the issue of uh, how can other people drive and give up driving in the right time by themselves, or how best to do that psychologically, and also from a procedure point of view, how can governments come up with a better way to limit the driving capability, which is not an easy thing to take away from an elder. This is the Oak Hammock uh, community, and this is where the smart house is. This is a city living facility. It's a CCRC, so you find normal homes, you find uh, just uh, apartment, and then you find assisted living facility, three types. One is memory, one is medical, and one is, mem uh, one is memory, one is medical, one is normal. Uh, so memory has a lot of restriction on where people go, they're basically tracked. Uh, medical is where we have more medical facilities and so forth. That's where the smart house is located. This is a team that work primarily here to find people from uh, rehab and nursing, and these are all computer scientists right here. This is Bill Mann, who is my uh, collaborator in the Smart House. He and I are considered the co-founder of, of that house. The goal of, of the Gator Tech Smart House is to transform the house into an assistive environment. Similar to an assistive device, now the whole thing becomes an assistive environment. So um, we're not looking to solving a very specific problem, but we're looking at how can we create a technology that allow for that to happen, that allow experts to tune that house to be more and more assistive, more personalized. Okay, so our my team work more on the enable, enablement of all this. That's why people call it middleware, for example. The performance metrics is quality of life, privacy, cost, and it's in the box or not. If you do the best thing in the world, and then the journalist walks into you and asks you, when is this going to be out? Uh, can there are rich people in uh, South Florida? Can we have uh, this in two million homes in South Florida? And you are a PhD professor, and you author, you don't know what to answer? That's a problem. That happened to me several times. I just didn't know what, what to answer. That's early on. That's like 2002, 2003. I just didn't like these journalists. Before I like them, now I don't want to see. When they ask that question, I don't know what to say. And the, the answer is, and you put what you have in a box and put it on the shelves in Home Depot or Target so somebody can walk in and look at the box, see icons, eye icon, uh, a wheel icon, see like that, what is the parameter of disabilities, 
and just buy the box for $1,300, maybe $1,100. Buy it, take it to his mom, call this Dish Network guy. The technician comes, spend half a day in the house, and then tell you it's done. You call an 800 number, give you credit card, and service are rolling in, and your mom is in a better place, and you are feeling much better about it. That's what the journalist is asking. Is your stuff ready to put it in the box? And the answer was always no, because whatever I was doing was never uh, something I can put in the box. So I'll go more gradually into explaining what that means in more technical terms. What's inside the gators? Gator takes from our house is dumb objects, chair, uh, fabled sensor activated devices, appliances, including medical uh, personal devices. Uh, new form of computers we call sensor platforms, and of course computers and all kind of wireless network. This is a list of sensor activator. I don't think anyone of you is interested to look at. Architecturally, the house uh, consists of a residential raised floor. It's about five inch, five to six inch actually, I'm not sure. But it's not the deep <coughs> raised flooring that you find in a computer room, just deep enough. I love it because ergonomically it's easy on your back. You can actually walk easily. It's blocks and have tile blocks on top of it and have these grooves in, in the middle that these grooves are filled with some kind of a metal, metal bridges, okay? So that allows you to just instrument anything, just about anything you want. Nobody sees anything. You can come to this area and just make, you know, turn it open in another area and then you can do all kinds of things. You can imagine what my students have in this big room in the back where they sleep, all kind of big sticks and stuff that the plumbers use to fish, to fish eye things. So they have all kind of funny tools. So instead of removing many blocks, remove the minimum blocks. This, what you see here is a picture where um, there's actually a, a sensor and a sensor platform that allow the floor to become a smart floor where it sense where people are. The other important aspect architecturally is a drop cam molding. This is not actually a smart home. It's just like I grab those from the web. I should take better picture. We have much nicer cam molding, but the idea is to have a cam molding that's dropped just enough so that it hides all the wiring. So if, if you want to use wire technology, it should be no, shouldn't be a problem. You can hide it easily. The cam molding is inside the smart house consistently, even in the closet, even in the bathroom, everywhere. And it has access to its own conduit system. So it's different from the other, from the rest of the house uh, conduit pipes. That allows you significant, if you have both, it's very difficult to find a situation where you need to, to retrofit or use a drill or do anything that's visible. We didn't forget accessibility that comes already well established. Wide hallways, wide entries to the uh, walking closets, dual dishwashers, meaning you, you clean from one dishwasher and then the dirty dishes go to the second and the new one from the top. So when you finish, you do that at the bottom. Now the bottom is a clean dishes and what you get dirty, you put on the top. So you can actually bypass the cabin system completely. And that's extremely useful for uh, people with certain disabilities. So things like this, we do not want to miss on. Rapid cool stove top, zero threshold uh, throughout the whole house, shower uh, uh, panic button, no burn, hot water mixer everywhere. So you cannot burn yourself with hot water even if you try. Okay, so uh, what services do we, did we try to target monitoring and control? Basically, monitoring activities of daily living, as much or as broad as that is, we try to monitor most of this. So you can imagine all kind of sensors that were used for that. Location. Where is the person at? Doors and window lock status. We need to know if anything's locked, anything's open. Front door status, meaning if there are visitors or a water leak or something. <laughs> Okay, good news. I didn't get the computer. I got it. Right here. Mailbox status. Arrival of a new mail. So the program officer that funded my research was very impressed with this particular feature. Say, oh, well, can your smart home tell the resident if this is junk mail or real? <laughs> you know, you have to pay us a lot more money to do this. Uh, daily schedule is another uh, monitoring thing, which is monitoring time. Again, it's scheduled activities like medicine uh, and uh, doctor appointments and so 
caloric intake and expenditure, this is new. We try to monitor anything that has to do with expenditure. So the smart home that, that monitors the location can now monitor your, how much are you walking. Are you walking okay or not? And then we, with recent research, we try to also find the vibration, not just the pressure, not that you are here or there. Try to find if you are barely walking you are, or you are barely walking. So if you're walking Berkeley, you would catch that in a signal. You keep integrating the signal accumulated over the entire day, and that gives you an index that you can map into calories. So uh, expenditure intake is more difficult. Mm. Do more kind of stuff to try to do cameras and detect chewing and detect the volume of the food chewing. We have several uh, papers and collaboration, but the reality is it's just not good research. It's not lead, it's not reliable research yet. So we're struggling with intake. Okay. There are more ways to find exactly what's going on here, but you have to use clumsy kind of equipment at home that will freak anybody out. We don't want to <laughs> go there. So it's, so it's uh, our job is to try to break through and apply as much as possible invisible. Software is king. Software. Software nobody sees running somewhere. Software can tell me how much a person ate. That is, that is king, right? And then the, on the other end of the scale is that particular carb or, uh, or a carbon device that you put in and then you breathe into, but we don't want to do that. So the cyber physical world and the cyber physical interface is indeed delicate. It has to maintain a delicate balance moving forward. You can over instrument. You cannot use crazy stuff. Hygiene is very important. Um, a lot of problems with ill people with hygiene lead into all kinds of bacteria. Get misdiagnosed as also, you know, if your body, if the home can tell the story, when that elder person walks into the doctor, she, you know, she remembers some, she doesn't remember others, and the doctor asking all kind of questions, and he's busy, and if the home tells the story, the doctor will know this is a helicopter pylori situation. This is not an ulcer. He will immediately know if the house tells. So that's our role is to figure out what's important. Okay. So how do I know about this? I don't know. Somebody told me this. Our role is to create a technology that's extremely flexible, that allow the people in charge, the doctors, the nurses, the clinical psychology, people who really can be empowered by all this, to use all this stuff. So that's the positioning of, of uh, my team or my group's research is that extremely elastic and extremely um, programmable technology. It's why I call it programmable pervasive space. To give you an idea, we have done a lot of demos with hygiene in the bathroom, and we brought in uh, uh, people from clinical psychology. They laughed at us, but they didn't kick us in the butt. They laughed at us in a very sweet way. They said, I love it, oh, I love it, and they laughed because this is not how people actually use the bathroom. Okay. So PhDs and masters, we don't know how you use the bathroom. Yeah, because this is not the science we specialize in. We're engineers, right? And we, 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 we actually can imagine a sequence of event, this and this and that. And so we, we want to see if the person enter, toilet flushed or not, water, uh, fluid sensor, not, water, soap used, not used, this and that, and we think we figured out by a small algorithm. But it's not exactly that simple. So, uh, which is very like how activities are very variant, and we can know they're very complex because of the variability in them. So, again, the idea is to not create a system that does hygiene. The idea here is to instrument and prepare the house so that people who are not computer scientists, domain experts, can find it extremely easy to program that space and to watch exactly what they want and to intervene in exactly the way they want. Control is event notification. So notifying, I better put this all the way here. <laughs> notifying the resident, appliance control, of course, this is a, a standard application in many places. Opening and closing front door, on-demand monitoring, back when the residents say, check if window is closed, check of this. People find it very important before they go to bed to get a confirmation everything is okay, for example. So just, it's an echo, say, so check. You know. Meal preparation, helping people uh, prepare a meal as much as we could. So we looked at frozen packets, gourmet frozen packets usually take several cycles from thawing to low power to high power. Some of them take actually three, three cycles. So this, for a normal person, this is a lot of work, just to attend to the microwave and to remember and to read small font and interact and to remember which stage you were in. I can challenge you if you get a, just a you know 25 years 
old student in this campus and give him one of these Stauffer gourmet meals, he can actually make a mistake of it. Let him do it three times. One of them will not work. He will forget where he was. So it's not reasonable to ask uh, our uh, elder citizen to, look, to, to use this, uh, this kind of uh, meals. But to help them, can we have a smarter microwave? Of course we can. Otherwise, we, you know, we are out of job. So let's, let's do it and then see how it works or not. Curtain and uh, contact setting, set the contact, uh, set TV mode on, going to sleep. Is a mood. So you can, instead of saying uh, small commands, you can give macro commands. Tell the house what you want or indicate what you want. So these are the services, monitoring and control. These are some of the projects that we have done and they, that is related to the smart, get a tech smart house. Um, I will not go over them in detail, I just fly through. Okay, and you can stop me if you feel like you want more detail in one of them, because I want to jump into the lessons that we learn and move on with the rest of the presentation. That is a smart wave. It's an RFID technology. It's hidden under the counter, but you put it here for to see it. RFID tags on the packets. You can access uh, FDA, sorry, uh, FDA database to get as much information as you can. And basically, you can add more information like visual and video and so forth. Once the packet comes close to the counter, basically, the microwave knows exactly how to cook this packet. And the rest is the microphone of the computer just basically stepping the, the resident about what to do. For example, the simplest thing, like make sure you remove the, so the, the wrap paper or so the paper, wrap paper. All this information is contained as part of the product in a government database, which is good. Is this available in the market? No. Barcode is, this is not. But we, we can look at the future and imagine that Walmart pushing RFID technology, why not? This is uh, all the hardware that was needed to modify. Uh, this is only general electric microwaves, it's not all microwaves. A uh, group of people who bring in to test. One of them was actually an ex-provost of the university. Uh, they're having a blast, they like it, and they're definitely very uh, open and straight. If you don't like something, they'll tell you right in your face, which is good. So people had fun. This was not, what you see here is not in the smart house. This is in my lab. So we call that Matilda smart house. This is where we do things right before we put it in the, in the target space. Mobile phones uh, helping in many different ways. This is a marketing slide. Just to give you one thing that we did, which is um, medicine compliance, Rem medicine reminder and compliance. So basically the phone rings at the right time to take the medicine. And then when you pick the, the call, it tell you what medicine you should take. Of course, you think of the iPhone and the Android, you say, this is a joke, I can do better. Of course you can. But you have to remember when this was done. This is the first Java phone in the United States. This is a Motorola Iden i88. This is the first. We had a, actually a project with Motorola. Uh, we were funded at that time. That's why I had access to it early on. And this is a sort of um, in-house made kind of verified reader. Uh, sorry, uh, infrared reader. So you're able to read barcodes. So the idea is to call and then the elder person will try to take the medicine but required to point and press any button. And that base connector now points to the RFID, sorry, the barcode and say yes, this is the right medicine or not. Again, all this, you can bring the right people who work in medical compliance, they will give you a pat in the back and say we appreciate all you're doing. This is not going to work. And why? And then we, we want to learn from them, not because that's our curricula that we're supposed to learn it, I don't feel we're supposed to learn it fully. We should just need to be aware, in principle, that there is a different world out there. It turned out a lot of the medicine compliance has to do with stubbornness, with the non-cooperation of the, of, the, of the patient, not wanting to take the medicine. This requires full uh, collaboration from the patient, and that's not the issue. Thank you. So uh, if after you do it, and even the phone keep an inventory of how many pills, it goes and, and call the pharmacy, the refill with a home delivery option. It comes, rings the door, and when the door rings, the big plasma display shows the guy, and then my program officer is very impressed. And I, and I continue to be funded. That's great, but it doesn't work. So you see, so there's that loop, like uh, uh, what are we supports our role? So uh, I hope in this lecture today, I can convince you that our role should continue to be engineering. Okay, But we should not work in vacuum. We should not subsume other 
discipline and domain role because we can never be experts on it. But we have to work with them next, I mean, shoulder to shoulder, next to them. They have to be a multi, there has to be a multidisciplinary team. And therefore, what I believe is very important is the flexibility and elasticity of the engineering, of the technology. You have to make it easy to be reshaped by them. You're just there helping that to happen. You're not there to be on the way. Smart floor, I already showed it to you. Um, the, as I said, there's a new uh, research we're doing in, in smart floor. I didn't bring it here, but if you are interested, it has to do with MIMS vibration sensor. If you are interested, you let me know after the talk. MIMS vibration sensor. The idea is, um, if you look back here, I'm sorry, this is too much instrumentation, too much wiring. Okay, so that go against the in the box. It's not going to fly. So we need something that doesn't have a lot of wires. This is we're looking at the vibration. This is a pressure sensor. Self-sensing space is a project where we use three different ideas, smart plug, uh, pervasive vision, and uh, a robot to together try uh, to sense things. The smart plug sends any pluggable instrument in the house. And the uh, provision uses RFID technology to do parsing of the scene parsing. So if you have a computer vision scene, and now you're sensing that scene, you have, the, you have your pixels, but also you're sensing these tags, and these tags describe their objects, their own objects. Then now you have a way to do something different in the computer vision field, which is computer vision with parsing. It's not just classification and all that. You're now parsing things out. It gets you to zip through very quickly, even in the, in the worst light condition and all. So you're able to get this scene out of this scene. That's called, um, we call it pervasion. And then a sensor boat is uh, a robot that walks around in a house, especially one instrumented with our floor. Because our floor is quantized, you have blocks. So the, the, the error rate of the sensor boat should be 0%. If it can walk to a block, it should sense a block. And since the unit is a block, then the, you're able to produce a floor plan of the house. This is the actual floor plan, and this is a sensible floor plan. It should be identical, because it's quantized which is nice. So how can you find the floor plan of a house? Why do I need this? Because I, want, I need everything. I need the floor plan. I need to know what is plugged. I need to know what's going, what, is, what are the objects, dumb objects in the room, so that I'm able to create something like this. What is that? That's a self-sense space. What is the utility of such a thing? Well, how about uh, remote monitoring and intervention? Instead of waiting in a call center receiving a phone call, a phone call will pop up that display. Now you are seeing the whole space automatically, without having to go get the title of the house and look at the floor plan and do any crazy thing, just simple. So here's a, a demo where the uh, an operator can click an area, zoom into it. Now this is, as you can see, a, a lamp here. This lamp is seen because its tag through the smart tag indicated that it is a lamp and where it is connected to. And actually provided a method, a Java bundle, method of how, what operation defined on it. So the operator, Realize the situation is that you need more light in the room. The operator drag the mouse and go over the lamp. And then when you do that, you download all the methods. And here is turn on, turn off, call local repair, whatever method. And you click on the right method, click on on, and actually light goes on. Now, the, re the reason this lit up is not because the light actually went on. This is part of the, of the immersion, part of mimicking reality. You can ask, but what if the light did actually turn on that? Yes, yeah, the problem. Okay, so this would be an interface for remote monitoring and intervention, better than just receiving a phone call and talking. We learned two important lessons from the Gate of Tech Smart House. First one is, I will never do it again. <laughs> <laughs> At least not that way. It was so punishing to try and I'm a computer scientist. I happen to have a little bit of experience in electrical engineering. That was my bachelor degree. But it is very difficult to, co to convince people, PhD students, that you are a good advisor for them, even though you are a computer scientist. But you want them in a double E project. It's just confusing to them. And they, really? I'm just confused. But it's involving significant integration. Integration is a nightmare. It's a bad thing. Okay. So that's the learn lesson we learned, is that don't do it again. Never integrate that way ever again. 
Ideally, we don't want to integrate at all. Can we have a world that's self-integrative? So maybe that's what we should busy with. Instead of meeting all the journalists and bragging about a smart house, if I just sit down and figure out how to do this. And that's exactly what shaped one of my agenda is, how do we do self-integrative spaces? The reason this is a nightmare is because you have a non-scalable uh, situation here. Every new item you try to integrate, you have to learn about. It. You have to read about it. You have to integrate it. And then when you come to integrate other things, you may have to backtrack and use different technology. It, it uses closed world assumption, fixed concepts, and uh, it's not flexible. I can dwell on this and bore you, but I think we don't have time. The second rule is very interesting. And um, again, what help us find it are actually the domain experts, okay. nurses and uh, clinical psychologists in particular. The 2080 rule. When we build a smart home and uh, we have an opening or we should be, we think we're done. So our experience tell us that that amount of effort is only 20% of the total effort needed. You have 80% to go after your space is instrumented, running, and getting the wows and people saying, well, nice. But in fact, what you built is only <coughs> you design and, and, and deploy the space. But don't think you ever programmed it yet to customize it, because that's a different world. We engineers were not really fit to do it. We just fit to create the programming models, the programming mechanism, the system support to build this. So the effective life cycle of an intelligent environment extends far beyond when it's first ready for operation. And any effort must take that effective life cycle into consideration. Now I'll talk about uh, some reactions. We reacted quickly to this integration and the 2080 rules. So we needed to create something that addresses these two issues. We call that program of pervasive spaces. We gave it a name, Atlas. Uh, Jeff King, one of my students, gave it Atlas. And when I asked him a few years later, why did he choose Atlas, he cannot remember. So we're all stuck with that name. Okay, let me put all the bullet here. Decouple deployment. So what is ATLAS or what is Program of Pervasive Spaces? It's a research approach in which you decouple deployment, or people call it instrumentation, from programming application. So you render an application-less smart home, application-less intelligent environment, but do it and do it right. And then let's all focus on the application. Enable automatic and continuous self-integration. Now that you create, created that application-less space, a new device comes in that you feel you will need it, you want to bring it in. All you need to do is to bring it to the space, power it up. No integration, zero integration. Otherwise, it's crazy, it's madness. Forget it. So if we can arrive at something like this, where we decouple and allow for this continuous dynamic system, self-integration, and then allow for a programming and configuration of the space, of course. If you don't have that, you haven't done anything. Ensure openness and interoperability. Uh, over time, and uh, define a support and a full-time cycle of the pervasive space. So in other words, either you go find some software engineering and be friends with them, or they are your friends, or become a software engineer. We have to address the software engineering aspect. So this is a whole architecture. I'm not going to bore you with the detail, but there's one, two, three, three main uh, bytes in that architecture. One is a way to describe sensors and devices. We call it description, uh, device description language. Second is a sensor platform to which you connect these sensors and devices. Third is a middleware. You call the Atlas middleware. Atlas middleware gives you basic services and then give you higher level services like query processing, give you uh, phenomenon detection and tracking, what's it called sensor virtualization, or familiar with virtualization. It gives you also uh, some kind of eventing and reactivity engine. So these are higher level services, but these are the basic services here. Between the hardware, the sensor platform, as you see, it's a hardware. Between the hardware and the basic services of the software, the architecture allows devices to, when they are powered up, to sort of get to, to deliver a presentation that is completely service oriented software. So I have here a, a, a blood pressure monitor, measuring device. I power it up. Since I powered it up and I have its DDL, 
and I connect it to a sensor platform, the computer for the sensor. Just because I did this and I have that, and all of a sudden I see that blood pressure monitoring device as a job object. Once I see the job object, I'll be darned if I go back and touch that device, right? I don't need to. I'm happy now. I'm a programmer. We're computer scientists. We know how to deal with this world. This was like uncomfortable zone to us. Well, great. Thank you. I'm going to use this. What are the methods? This is great. Thank you very much. What application do you want me to develop? I'll do it for you. That's the idea, is to literally convert hardware into software. If we are doing it, then we're able to tap on this IT community. Any programmer anywhere in the world can now program pervasive spaces if that is enabled. First one is uh, DDL. When we looked at DDL, we found that there are actually many standards out there. Equinet was one. Uh, so that we were even involved in ourselves. So we studied a bunch of uh, device languages and we came up with DDL. The idea here is to not get carried away and create a language that tries to describe a Canon printer. Because there are different ways to do this, like UPMP. We needed to come up with a simple thing that enable address these exact issues. Self-integration and programmability. And look at these poor, you know, homeless and poor guys which are small pin head sensors, two pins, three pin sensor. They have no brain, no computer. Those are the guys we worried about. And the, the higher in the, this hierarchy you go, like a powerful device, the job is easier. But we wanted to, to focus on these small things, not a footprint. We don't want to get there. So it's a delicate balance. When you read DDL specification, you can see its boundaries. And that's where we spend a lot of energy defining the boundaries. This is an example of a temperature sensor. Some of you may know uh, sensor ML. Sensor ML is one of the sort of least marketed and advertised. One of the greatest things that happened that I've seen personally. It's an amazing standard. Sensor ML is a standard to describe data. I recently got into the business of describing data sets, and uh, Dr. Cook knows about this. So I, we have to see what's out there. Sensor ML is a fantastic standard to describe data. The, it's used mainly by NASA and by people who do remote monitoring and remote sensing. Because data from the source, the very, very first source of the data, could be completely different from what you are actually sort of seeing in front of your eyes. For example, temperature. What is the very first source of the data? It's voltage variation. It's, there's, no temp there's no Fahrenheit, no centigrade, nothing. There's just voltage, right? That is the source data. So sensory ML tries to preserve the source and any recognition or or um, derivation that happened through the path until you see this data in a file and say, I'm using a data set. So anyway, we did something similar, but very light. Here you can see a temperature is actually defined on that voltage from different ADC, from different pins, specific pins. To that level, you are able to describe these small devices. So if a company that produces a temperature sensor can also produce that much, seven, 12 line of code, that's DDL, these 12 line of code will go a long way. And their engineers should be able to handle it very easily. Now, I can take these 12 lines and create that Java object I was telling you about that will actually control that device. But I first have to connect that temperature sensor into, again, something. It has no brain. It doesn't know how to communicate. It's hopeless. So I need to connect it to a computer of the sensor. And what you see here is a full node of what's called the Atlas platform. This is a a layer where you connect sensors and devices to. So this is I.O. This is a brain, which is an admin that make a processor. And this is IP communication, Wi-Fi, Ethernet. We have Zigbee also into a Zigbee gateway. So we put it all together. We worked heavily on this. We got it to where we were able to actually um, get it to work with that software that we're talking about, show you next, which is the middleware. And all you need to do is just to power the node, and then the DDL flow through the node, and then basically get converted into a Java object. Okay. That Java object can now be used by application developer. It could be awaited for because there is some application that depends on it, waiting on a service discovery to discover that particular object type to use its method. All world of what's it called service composition and SOA, service oriented architecture. All that world now, we tap into it. Okay. It is existing. It's not our world. We're just using it. Here is a simple demonstration. This is actually a smart house. Somebody go and, and put three of these nodes 
sensor powers them up, another person in the lab will go take something like a, a Java Eclipse, an Eclipse development tool, and instead of going into a, a working directory, you CD into a working directory, you see your Java project, right? Now, you just CD into the IP of the house, and you see your project, you see three Java objects. Now, you can click on them, you see the manifest, you look at the methods, you know what to do. Service composition from that point on. Okay, so somebody go to a space, instrument it, somebody else, somewhere else, is now able to see these Java objects, the bubbles that are a representation or a shadow of what you, of the physical world is now software. Now you're able to do what you need to do. Is this clear? Okay. Some of the sample projects is uh, Stepstone. Again, uh, we collaborated with Dr. Koch on this research. <coughs> Here we have a device connected to Atlas and then um, the rest is history. Like this is IBM collaborator. People from IBM, they, they have all these servers and portals, technology, of course. So we use their technology to show that just by getting a DDL representation for the device, powering it up into a node, then you are enabling the entire backend, including mobile application and all that. The entire Stepstone uh, code set is uh, open source and it's actually available. You can download it uh, at any time. You can just Google Stepstone. And uh, you should be able to get it from uh, Eclipse Foundation and also from uh, op Open Health IT, Open OpenHealthTools.org, OpenHealthTools.org. So you can actually, if if you do, if you want to use all this stuff, then it's free. You can just use it. And uh, there is another version being deposited now that includes also social network addition to this. Another project is how can we take a robot like this and make it also an Atlas device? Remember, Atlas control sensors and actuators. These are complex sensor and actuator. So make this an Atlas robot is a challenge. So it refunded us for three years now, and we managed to connect this robot here, uh, called Eugene Robot, into Atlas. And now we have that robot at, uh, at the University of Florida we just acquired. It. It's called Aldi Barn now. It's a fantastic, amazing robot, and uh, we're making it an Atlas robot as well. So why am I working on robots all of a sudden? It's because, uh, as I mentioned to Larry and Jim this morning in the house, we are a community that's extremely successful. I should humble myself a little bit, right, Anthony? Right? <laughs> we do a lot of work. We seem to be scoring success in monitoring and getting data and stuff out. But we, are not, we have not have done much in the way back. When it comes to intervention and convincing and persuading the user, we just not, it's not a big area for us. But what we're seeing, we really need to look back. How can we go and affect you? So we need a channel back. So sensing is one thing, but affect, affecting things is a different story. So in the smart house, we have all kind of failure story I can share with you later. Nothing really worked in way of going back to the user. Smartphone this, smartphone, all the smartphones, you name it, uh, touch screens, uh, wireless voice, we have done everything. It's just not working. <laughs> the, the, the simplest surprise is that uh, one subject, the entire trial is basically failed because one subject had a little discord, uh, lack of coordination between when she pressed, which was a wireless voice, push to talk and actually talking. Okay, so she would talk and, and push it slightly after she talked. Chipping off the beginning of the command is enough to throw off any voice recognition. That's it. So the command just goes to waste, waste, waste. So nothing is going. And then we, we couldn't understand. And we had to figure out, it turned out, this is it. We didn't think about it. So anyway, we, we're now looking at robots to become a good uh, mediator or agent to, in which the smart home can communicate with the elder. In fact, the smart home is a spooky thing. When we, when we talk to the home, some people didn't like it. It's like so spooky. But when you get Kevin, his name is Kevin. When Kevin come to you, and um, yeah, you can actually, uh, it's available in the web, you can, you can search now, and play. very cute, very personal life. He can actually talk about, he can look like he's shy, he can address an issue, but you know, overeating or this or that, <laughs> he's cool. You know. So he, we can rely on, uh, on this research. So uh, a group in Stanford working on persuasion research within Ubicom, so we started to follow their traces, we're reading up as much as we can, 
It's very interesting. So one of my students, uh, Ducky Lee, he has now something called the uh, action-based behavior model. Uh, only if I can understand it, I think he would be a great student, but I can still not understand. He knows so much more than I do, because he has been reading all this. So I need to catch up with him. Uh, so anyway, enough said about the robot. But the main contribution so far that we enabled one programming model, which is service-oriented programming model. So hopefully, let me say it one final time. We take a space okay, that has sensor and devices, and we don't know how to program it, how to develop applications. So we separate, just deploy. Once you deploy every element in that space, become now is represented with a bubble. These bubbles are SOA, service-oriented, Java objects. From that point on, we can claim that we have now a programming model in a humble way. The programming model is service-oriented architecture. Now, more than ever before, you can program that space because I can create application one, application two. I can wake up tomorrow morning and change application two. It doesn't work. The hygiene, the way I'm detecting the hygiene is bad. So the psychiatrist told me, or psychologist, sorry, told me, this is not the way you do it. This is the way you do it. No problem. I have all the basic bubbles. I will reshuffle them, I will recompose them again. Next day, I can redo that again. Okay, I can recall an application. So we enable programming. It's a simple SOA. That is our baseline. And we, we had a lot of champagne. We are very happy. We just felt like we know, we're kings. We managed to do it. And we, we really had a lot of uh, fun because it was a big moment for us. And we kept around uh, breaching the world about the Atlas and about this way, we're just so happy and gratified with what we did. Only to discover, and I wish I know how to do this animation better, <coughs> only to discover that we got ourselves into trouble. Okay. Because there's, there is a jungle out there. We found that there are limitations to what we just built. We solved the problem and we cre immediately created the other problem. So let me share this um, problem with you, and I think I'm running out of time here. I'm fine. Okay. Thanks. So these are the trouble. Basically, uh, for about half a year, we were like, we were just so happy to, to add this problem. We don't want to even tell anybody about it. That's the Girard. <laughs> we just like, we don't want to talk about it, okay? But here we're just putting all the stuff. But the real problem is that the ant and the elephant, that's one problem. The overpromise of the service-oriented model that we just use and adopted is it overpromises. When when everything looked to you like a beautiful service, and SRA programming is just enabled like crazy, you need to remember these services are not living in a uh, in a Dell hardware server that you paid six thousand dollars for, with multiple you know power supply and with uh, hot swappable this and that. It's sitting on a something that we even created in the lab, something so tiny, supposed to be very cheap, a sensor platform. That's not a Dell server. So you are taking an ant and putting a mask with an elephant on it and really dealing with it as an elephant. It doesn't have that much mass. So if you enable servers, uh, if you enable programming through service oriented, you want to watch out because you overpromise. Is this clear? You overpromise. It's not a real service. We just forced a service interface in it, which makes it super easy to program, which is nice. We needed that. But now, watch out. Uh, most of your programs will have a reliability problem, major reliability problem. The ant and the other. And that's a serious problem. But the most serious problem is this. We created a problem now because it only takes a monkey to mess up that space. You made it so accessible, so easy. You put every element in that space out, say, take it, take it. It takes a monkey to create a dangerous, dangerous app, right? Because now it's so accessible. It's like allowing anybody to drive anywhere. That's, that's, that's not right. So the monkey is a big problem. Well, it's like, what, what, what are you saying? You're confusing me. You don't want to say I want to improve programmability, and now we are complaining. Well, I'm complaining because there, is no, there are no restraints. Like, it's very dangerous, actually. In fact, we had a problem ourselves. It, we had a major bug in the smart house, and it happened. It happened. And, uh, and I, I honestly believe there was nothing intentional for my student. My student would not hide anything. 
It just happened to be on Halloween day. And the uh, whole camera community had to call me in the middle of the night. The smart house is going crazy! <laughs> and it just things are turning on and off and all that stuff. And he just couldn't take it. The security guy was one of these kind of uh, guys. He's just going crazy. We literally had to go there and find out nothing. We just reset the computer. Everything is fine. Bucks. Everything is a service. Anybody, any one of my students can have any application. They didn't analyze, but they said, we don't know. It's just the guy is just, uh, it's just hardly, you know, he, he was ready to feel something scary going on. So monkey can really endanger that space. So how do we react to those? So we reacted in two different ways quickly to the phenomenon. Okay. I'm sorry, to the, to the um, overpromise, the ant and the elephant. We realized that it's a good idea to now think of how people utilize sensor data. So uh, instrumenting a space, getting stuff out, the services is one thing. But do we really have to use it that way? For example, I need to know if somebody's walking, where the, people, where the person is walking. Okay. Why do I insist on reading a particular sensor of that block to know that the person is walking in that block? Maybe we should look at something that's more forgiving to the ant and the elephant. And that's a phenomenon, walking phenomenon. If I just detect phenomena, if I engage more, if I engage more cells around me, then uh, even if there is a, a dying ant, it's not going to hurt. Okay, I move forward, things will work. So we started to redefine a walking application. And instead of reading a walking sensor, we read a walking phenomenon, and we just need to define that phenomenon. So we start to work on phenomena detection and formulating what the phenomena should be. I'm not going to go over this, but just a phenomenal definition that we have. We rely on a, a range, on a probability threshold, okay? Because you, ha you have to decide whether it's part of the phenomenon or not. It relies on a forum. How many, what, how many, what is the radius of engagement, you know? And also on the window of time. Window of time is very critical. When you combine the window and quorum, you enter into a very fascinating research, actually, and you realize there are interesting trade-offs to, to, to tune this right. But I'm not going to be spending a lot of time here. We have uh, tracking candidate and potential candidate, uh, of course, an idle sensor. These are the four stages. Y4, you could actually make a mate if you want. But this was tractable to us. And we managed to handle it. So this is what the, how the phenomena build up and how it actually shrinks. And there are rules for uh, changing a node, changing from one um, status to the, to the other, role transition. Rule. I don't want to go over it, but but anyway, the the performance of the phenomenon tracking has to be as such that you want to show that you're not involving way too many nodes to detect a phenomena that is too small. If the phenomena has a diameter, then ideally your um, your cover set should be the same diameter as the phenomenon. Ideally, it has to probably most practically be a little bit bigger, but should be much bigger. So you have to come as close as the phenomena diameter. That's number one. Number two, you have to worry about uh, false positives. And uh, you, you have to also worry about uh, power, because you're using power. Uh, in our case, all the nodes were powered using DC power from the home. So it wasn't a concern. But that's not the view of the rest of the world. The rest of the world want to st still see the power consumption. So we started to move a few things that we would use normally by reading sensor into reading a phenomenon. And that helped in the ant and the elephant situation. The other idea was virtual sensor, sustaining SOA uh, in presence of uh, failures. And instead of using sensor, we're using with some knowledge about it. This is really fascinating research, but we haven't carried on as much as we wanted. We define something called physical sensor, which is, uh, which is a raw sensor data that you read. And then they have singleton virtual sensor. That's when you start adding knowledge. Virt uh, basic virtual sensor and derived virtual sensor. I'm not going to bore you with all this. Just show you quickly what I mean here by looking at this figure. Actually, um, yeah, just here, just the summary is here. Collect similarity statistics to determine groups of sensors exhibiting similar behavior over time. So you have space and time to look at these correlations. Okay, and now you can utilize this correlation. Time is very important. In fact, if the space dimension falls to zero, to no dimension, time is still useful. For example, if there is a critical sensor, 
that enters into an application. And that sensor, if you look statistically, it's history. It shows you certain values. And the values are nice and confined over a very tight normal, for example, or something like that. And then there's an application that would otherwise be unavailable if that sensor is not available. That sensor died, just died. Okay. You can virtually use that sensor through its history, at least temporarily. And that will reinvigorate availability of the, of the application and the service. So even if the space dimension falls to zero, you still, time dimension can help. Having time and space are very important. Similarity with other sensors is, uh, is also important. So you can substitute sensors. Okay. For example, you have a uh, pressure sensor on the floor, but you have presence of sensor somewhere else. The pressure sensor died. Now you can use the presence sensor, which is some kind of a range or infrared uh, motion sensor. So Raj Abose is now with the Nokia research. He started that research. He published two papers. He only opened up a lot of things. Most of it comes outside my jurisdiction a little bit, so we sort of didn't follow up on it. But there are two, two papers that describe possibilities of, of uh, virtualization for sensor. Let's move now. Uh, now this is <coughs> This is the last part of my talk, is, which is um, uh, safety, the monkey. What do we do about that monkey? This is brick and mortar homes, which are very safe, high safety. This is expressiveness. A brick and mortar cannot do anything. It's, it's not a smart home, but it's very safe. As you try to express more intelligence, in the space, you lose some safety. So we imagine there is a hypothetical minimum accepted safety here. And we admit that the service-oriented model falls below that. It's not safe. And we look at other models. In fact, one of them is context-driven model is done by uh, Edwin Jensen, one of my uh, XPG students. He's in Microsoft. And uh, whatever he did, uh, he, you know, both of us were not very happy about it. We shelved it for a while. But now we look at it, we realize it's actually very interesting work, but for a certain application space. Here, the model is extremely safe and give you a little bit of expressiveness. The model basically is to program anything, is to define, con define context. And based on context, you actuate an actuator or two. That's it. That's all you could do. And then we realize you cannot do too many things, like detecting somebody entering the house, leaving the house. That's simple. You couldn't do it that much, because it doesn't capture time. There is no temporal relation in it. So it was very unexpressive. We, we had so much time, so it's just nice theoretical work stopped. But now we look at the auto industry. This is exactly what they do. This is exactly what they do. Context, actuate, and actuator or two. So we are limited by our own domain, smart home, healthcare, and elder. But reality, pervasive computing, should extend to other spaces, such as a vehicle. So this is not too bad anyway. Now, we need to go here to more safer and also expressive areas. So we started to work on new models. Context lock model is uh, Chao. Uh, Chao Cheng is one of my PhD students. He's now advanced that model, very interesting work, and also constrained reactive model. Now, this talk can, can take more time. If I keep talking about all the things, I'll just sample a few things. And you feel free to email me if you're interested. Um, what I'm trying to show you here is, in these two models that I refer to, we we'll look at what's called ele element safety, the space element of safety, or elements of safety of the space. Sorry, there's something missing here. So first, we define user safety. We say this. User cannot be interrupted at four in the morning because there's something funny in the house, like, uh, I don't know, you got mail. Four in the morning, guy has heart problems, you know, a heart attack, dies. You know, impossible. Okay. So what that means means that even if the programmer wishes to actuate the speakers, don't allow it. So this is called user safety. Device safety. Okay, so a company called no well, whatever, who could create a very interesting device which is a door handle. When you touch it, it takes on biometric and it's a handle and everything. Very nice. It has a strike mechanism to open also automatically and, and all. They put it in the market, you buy it, 
It's too open, you put it in your space, you program it. Guess what? Intentionally or non-intentionally, you have a bug. You're trying to actuate that strike mechanism over 50,000 times per second. What's going to happen to that device? It's going to burn. If it burns, the door will be open. Uh, and of course, if you're on floor, the bugs will enter. That's number one, and then the thief. But it's, it's dangerous because the device will not function anymore. So actually, we realize that the very sensor we're talking about, they have, they have to worry about their own safety. They need to be safe. So device safety wasn't very clear to us, but we found it. So, oh, great. Now we understand something. We need to define device safety and allow the programmer to do anything you want. But don't mess with device safety. Every device knows its safety, sa safety net. And we found the right place to put it in DDL, device description language. That's where the, every manufacturer say, hey, you cannot, maximum frequency of use, for example, is this, time between use. For example, uh, uh, Jim was talking today about two seconds, the, the duty cycle of uh, motion detection in two seconds. Also, do not interrupt. The device needs two seconds to sense. Temperature sensor, for God's sake, have, have actually duty cycle. To, to sense temperature, temperature, it takes time. So do not try to take another reading. You just bother the device, okay? So device safety. So we say everything here is safe, unsafe. Everything here is safe, and this is unsafe. Similarly, space safety. It's a, it's a bit bigger metaphoric thing. But space safety is like space tools. Hospital. Hospitals should not have certain uh, uh, viruses, certain bacteria in the space, if you have bacteria sensor. Uh, a church should not have uh, uh, loud noise, for example, during service. So you need to not allow certain things. You just not have, even if the smartest programmer does some, no, no noise. So again, the, 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 the speaker example comes in here. Not allowed. So for space safety, kindergarten, for example, is a, is a famous example. You should, you should definitely put cameras, register everybody. Anybody who enters through the door that's not, his face doesn't match. Okay? That shouldn't be allowed to start with, right? So you can imagine spaces have their own safety. Finally, you have what's called service safety. That's a more deeper topic and it's not very convincing. And at first, so I take more time to describe it. I will skip it. But if you do that, then that becomes the area that you can program in. Safe pervasive space. And even then, we can easily prove through counterexample that that's not ultimately safe. That's not like 100% safe. It's a way much safer space. Similar to, the approach is similar to mimicking lotus scooter. In other scooter, you get this uh, all round rubber uh, bumper, you get a flat out speed limiter. You press as much as you want, it's not going to go anywhere. The overturning, you can turn a million times and it turn only once. So you're mapping programmer wishes that big into practical possibility that small. That's our approach, is to define this element safety and then let the programmer get away with anything they want to do, so long as it does not contradict with, so long as it's inside that space as I showed you. Everything else is not going to happen. What is a fallback? Well, the programmer have a horse exception so the programmer has to use exception uh, as a standard way of programming, which is a good practice, which is what we all do. You never say uh, system call. You always say if system call return a problem, right? Because you call the system call, and if it doesn't return a problem, you're good. So that's how it should, things should be. Context lock, uh, the context lock, I will uh, skip it. That's very interesting research by Chow. I expect it to be uh, um, published soon. Now, this is, this is really the last element of my presentation here. It's for two minutes, and, uh, and I added it because uh, I know uh, Anne and I work in this area, so, which is, again, if we, if we are the preacher, the preaching about uh, don't just hack it up, you know, create something that's programmable, we have to ask ourselves, in which way we actually program a space? So actually, we program a space by utilizing its sensor data. So one way to utilize it is a standard mode, which is raw data, raw sensor data. Just use it, boom. The other way, which is almost like a, the first derivative of data is events. If you, if you impose a differential equation model, if only I know how to do this, I would do it, but I don't know how to do it. If you put one order, if you put the first derivative here, it's event. It's not the sensor data. It is a combination of certain event. Sometimes we need to do event processing. So, if somebody is going to grade me, say, if 
if my team and I did a good job of programmability, uh, I seem to be getting away with, with the raw sensor data. Okay, but I should really be graded on this and that. How about eventing? It's a big area now. Uh, can I program a space in which I, is, is your stuff enough for me to program a space by defining events and utilizing events? Or is it all about just raw sensor data? So that embarrasses us a little bit. So I have to work in this area. Finally, activity. In, in reality, people build spaces, and one big area of research is detecting activity. I don't care to sense a sensor. I want to sense if the person is eating, if the person is this, if the person is that. Where's a supposed person is happy? I mean, that's a powerful space if I'm able to say the person is happy. How? This is a huge thing. But that's where the stakes are. People want to go for this stuff, detecting activities and behaviors and modes. Okay, so guys, that's difficult. But if your space is really programmable, please support this and that to me. Okay, so let me show you as a final thing in my presentation, a little effort we did to support uh, activity recognition that we feel is programmable, it's more programmable than what it is today. In analyzing activity recognition, you see activities are pretty complex and uh, there's a major issue of scalability. In which way? The, the issue manifests itself. To detect anything, you, you literally have to research it, create a whole research effort, a model, and then you have to uh, train the model, and then you have to now worry about the performance of the recognition. That's not programming, that's research, that's, that's a whole task, it's a whole research issue. We want to turn this into programming. How? Well, the programmer knows what, need to, what, the, what the area of concern are, what need to be detected, the programmer is not an expert in what is the perfect set of sensors to use to detect it. And the programmer doesn't have time or the capacity to keep building models and re retrain them and change them. Our observation is that current models, current activity recognition models, tie in the sensor as an observation layer with the model. And if you change the sensor, you have to change the model. And you have to, well, you have to also to retrain it. So, we needed to change it. We needed to make it more of a programming step. We tried to find a way to separate the activity model from the observation system, come up with a generic algorithm that would be more scalable. That, in other words, I don't have to create a specific model, like a hidden market mo uh, uh, model for it or anything else. Uh, utilize an activity knowledge base. We tell you the story about the activity knowledge base first. We found that we're, we're over-challenging ourselves when it comes to activity recognition. When we recognize an activity, it's not in vacuum. If I recognize an activity of an elder person living in an assisted living facility, we can analyze this for, let's say, maybe a month, and then we end with a closure and say, this is it. This is all that could happen in that space. Now, can we compile a set of facts out of this? Yes, here are the facts. Hmm. So if it's not this, it has to be some of those, yes. So in the progression of an algorithm, try to, to find an activity, we try to create algorithms that are extremely smart. Because we're pushing a lot of pressure on the algorithm. While in fact, there is a set of facts, a cloud. OK, right, see, it's like, this is my agent, and we are overdoing it. You need to cut this short. I just say this and finish. But a set of knowledge, fixed knowledge, facts, that can actually help the recognition algorithm to get away and finish the recognition and come up with a reasonable guess. So what we're trying to do here is to not ignore that notch, bring it, bring it in. So we do that by defining what, um, 6 p.m. I'm confused about the time zone. <laughs> this is a schema of, of, a, of an entity relationship, entity relationship schema of the knowledge base. The idea is to pass it on to certain community. So my student Yunju is building an as daily living activities and want to put it out to the community to say, well, if you have a better, if you have any edits, please do the edits. And then we use it along with the algorithm that we have to do the detection. The algorithm is basically nothing more than a, it's a neural network, an error back propagation algorithm, that when you apply the knowledge base to it, it will ruin a lot of the edges. So it's become like very small, thin and tall shrubs to reach the goals very quickly. So we are not going to use any <coughs> of the, uh, uh, we're not going to use any of the uh, uh, hidden markup models. We're not going to use anything that requires training, basically. It's just a knowledge base 
the sensor, the, the sensor layer become a very dynamic layer. Feel free to replace a, a sensor with another and don't have to retrain and then you are still doing the recognition. So that's early research. I just brought here, it's, it's not highly mature, even though we have a paper to Ubicom, but I, wanna bring, I wanted to bring it here because I know it's related to, uh, to Larry and Dan. I think that's it. Um, and I will talk to Jim about this slide later because there isn't much time at all. I'll stop here and thank you very much for listening and for uh, bringing me here. And for a few questions. So, so where do the DDLs actually live? The, that, that text itself, it, does it live on, you know, on one of those boards and is passed up once they're connected? No, no. the DDL is a, is a file, you host it anywhere. But anywhere where you have a name, a URL to it. Okay. And now, all you need to store in the in the device, well, all the device, the sensor platform need to get is that link. Okay. And then, um, from a community point of view, you have a space to put that DDL in what's called a repository. From an organizational point of view, suppose you adopt Atlas in a in a place then you also have your own repository, so anything you use is in the repository. Mm -hmm. um, the, actually, the activity knowledge base you're talking about at the end, um, is that something that you came up with? I mean, the actual, say, steps that a certain activity involves, or is there any research in any communities for decomposing activities into the, steps and so forth? Yeah, there, there are research uh, activities going on. We just haven't seen that this kind of knowledge bases, these kind of ontologies and knowledge bases are used to guide the detection. We felt that that's a missed opportunity. Right. Because, for example, if, suppose you're inserting a new sensor or replacing a sensor. Now, how can that sensor relate to which activity? Is it, uh, pick, suppose you have low level activities, activities, meta activities. Suppose uh, one sensor enter into picking food, into cutting food, dicing food, into uh, lifting food, chewing. Then you start having the basic that lead into eating activity, for example. So I just add the sensor. Uh, I don't know if it, fit, it, it fits a certain activity or not, but if the knowledge base knows that, given the collective wisdom of this community, and again, remember, it's not going to be like something for everything, like a system living for, uh, uh, activities of daily living, knowledge base. Somebody can propose it. We, we, are, we are very confident it will take a short period of time to, for it to converge into a community resource. Improvement, enhancement, changes. So at some point, there will be a mapping. Part of the capture of that knowledge base is what sensors map to which activities, basic activities. So automatically, when you insert a sensor, that link between the observation system and to the rest of the activity model these links are automatically established. Okay. Now you can say, well, suppose there's a brand new sensor nobody ever thought of, just newly added. That's fine. Why don't we go and update this community resource? Okay. But we want to have this resource to be available as a, as, a, as a cloud at any time to assist you in the recognition. So uh, the ontology work, the classifying work, uh, from, a, from a knowledge and ontology uh, point of view, is there. It's just utilizing it directly into uh, what we call an, uh, an overarching activity model. That is what we believe is needed. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming.